A compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. Double O Seven in Kazakhstan. Women adore this irresistible man wearing sunglasses and a bow tie. He's good at piloting a plane, driving a tank, and attending receptions. He has mastered all kinds of martial arts and can use all kinds of weapons. His enemies respect him, and his friends are a bit afraid of him. His code gives him the right to kill. He is 007 James Bond. His journey to Kazakhstan is incredible, but true. Apple orchards, the trees heavily laden with fruit, golden fields of Indian corn ripening in the sun, plantations of melons, rows of pall poplars growing by the side of canals. After the desert, the foliage seemed luscious and exuberantly green. We were nearing Almata from Fitzroy McKean's Eastern Approaches. A good spy is always either a double or triple agent. You can never say who works for who. Certainly the agents of the NKVD were assigned to describe every minute Fitzroy spent in Russia, China and Central Asia. But was also very brave, in English we call it a daredevil, and uh, would go and do very um, very adventurous, exciting things. Chapter one, a dossier on the spy. Excuse me, what is your name? Bond. James. Bond. James Bond. McLean. No, McLean, Fitzroy McLean. According to Ian Fleming, creator of the famous agent, Bond is a character based on various people. First of all, he's based on Fleming himself. Then Sidney Riley from Odessa, Serbian Dushko Popov, and finally the Scotsman McLean, who is said to have given Bond his character. And they were friends. In the 30s, Ian Fleming worked for Reuters in Moscow, while Sir Fitzroy worked in the diplomatic corps. He was generally a linguist, very clever man, and within a year he could speak fluent Russian. He was a diplomat, aristocrat, parliamentarian, journalist, one of the founders of the British Special Air Service, scholar, and practitioner of the secret war against the Soviet Union. He was known as the best hawk. And uh, one of the first things he did was to, to try and get to Central Asia. Of course, all these things seem strange. McLean was allowed to move along strategic main lines such as the Trans-Siberian and Turkestan-Siberian railways under supervision. The Soviet government invited a lot of foreigners to visit the USSR. The Turkestan-Siberian railway was one of the sightseeing routes. It was used to show how life had changed in Central Asia and Kazakhstan. Foreign agents really liked this route, which was widely known in the world. As for supervision, Sir Fitzroy dedicated many pages to the ruses which helped him evade the troublesome agents of the NKVD or People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs. There was always an NKVD person watching him. He, he, he knew about it. But he was, uh, he was like very brave, maybe a little bit crazy as well. He moved from Barnaul through Semipalatinsk. There is a quotation. The white houses are already seen as well as the snow white peaks of the Tian Shan behind them. Armati warmly welcomed the future Bond. Chapter two, Bond's adventures in Almaty. After a rough journey down long dusty roads, we passed through a colony of dilapidated Kazakh yurts on the outskirts and almost immediately found ourselves in the center of town. Almata must have been one of the most pleasant provincial towns in the Soviet Union, from Fitzroy McLean's eastern approaches. Almata translates from Kazakh as father of apples, and I agree with this, I've never tried such large and delicious fruits before, McLean wrote. Actually, this person was shown as a fierce opponent of the Soviet rule in official sources. Thus, it seems that he had to describe everything he saw with a negative attitude. However, we don't see this in his work at all. 
There are some more unclear things. Probably he invented something or concealed some facts. Anyway, he was a diplomat. McLean compared Almaty with Semipalatinsk, although it looked like he hadn't visited the city. He wrote that previously Almaty had been smaller than Semipalatinsk. Then there is 007's unique evidence about the city's appearance in the autumn of 1937. There are wide streets located perpendicularly to each other. Wooden and stone houses are painted white. The buildings were pre-revolutionary and ultra-modern. These buildings included government house, telegraph office, the cinema, scientific institutions, shops, and a few houses. The Dom Sovietov Hotel was located a bit away from the pavement. There were very beautiful flower beds there, and there were fountains. There are a lot of goods in the shops, especially in grocery stores. Trams are running regularly. The majority of the streets are asphalted. There is a large market in the city center. The population equally speaks Kazakh and Russian. McLean was surprised at these facts. In general, the man Bond was based on like Talmati. I'm deeply impressed by the prosperity and progress he wrote in his book. Having got off the train, James Bond, or the person he was really based on, went to the restaurant of the Dom Sovietov Hotel. He expected to see a dirty room, gloomy waiters, and unpalatable food there. However, the reality was different from his expectations. The restaurant was clean and cozy, waiters were friendly, and the food was delicious. He had some adventures, too. When he arrived in the city, he started looking for a place to stay. He found two hotels. One was the NKVD hotel and the other was the Dom Sovietov hotel. Both of them were packed. He was even going to sleep on a bench. However, he was lucky and slept in the red corner under the monument of Lenin spreading his arm. A portrait of Stalin was on the opposite side. Fifteen people who were there on a business trip were snoring, too. Then his opponents, wearing shoulder straps, helped him as a special agent stay in a cozy room of the Dom Sovietov Hotel. There are some photos you can see that the interior was very simple. There are square columns and a favorite of that time, wood-like panels, everything painted with ordinary paint. So Fitzroy went to Talga by lorry the next day. He wrote that it wasn't easy to find a car or petrol for a car to be exact. There were problems with fuel. He described, as most people I know do, like Kazakh people being kind and welcoming. The Talgar bond was supervised by two very watchful NKVD officers. They inspected fields and gardens and then had dinner at a local gardener's. The cottage contained one large room where the occupants slept and ate, a kitchen and a space for drying fruit and vegetables. It was built of mud bricks and whitewashed inside and out. We found a very old peasant woman and her two grandchildren aged four and five. They seemed delighted to see visitors and the grandmother immediately started to prepare a meal while I played in the garden with the puppy, the children and the NKVD man from Fitzroy McLean's eastern approaches. Then he saw the summer pastures, yurts, Isik Lake, and he swam in the cold water and slept on the shore. Watching the full moon over the lake, thinking he's one of the few Englishmen or even Europeans ever to see that sight. Almost a week was spent in Almaty and its suburbs. McLean didn't speak about the time precisely and it wasn't clear why. After that, he went to Samarkand and was going to come back the following year. Chapter 3, Never Say Never. In June 1938, Sir Fitzroy was following the moscow Almaty route, planning to go to China. Yes, of course, authorized bodies told him and started his trip. He went through Aris, Shimkent, and as he said, other pleasant villages covered in poplar groves. They stopped for a short time in Almaty and then arrived at Ayagoz, where the attentive Bond noticed the wooden houses, a local club, school, the monument to Lenin, and the market. While waiting for a bus, he observed a very sad scene. Before leaving Ayagoz, I witnessed a detachment paraded on the platform, where they proceeded to take charge of a contingent of prisoners who were then herded into a heavily barred truck. 
The prisoners, largely Kazakhs, seem for the most part indifferent to their fate. From Fitzroy MacLean's eastern approaches. The bus was two hours late and it was overcrowded. There were collective farm members and six small children on board. It was hot and impossible to open the windows. Some passengers had fainted. There were bumps and pits on the first-class Soviet roads. Fitzroy wrote, the future Bond was achieving his aim. He was occupied with the most important tasks which had been assigned to him in England. It was the reason why he had to go to China. His route passed through Baktu and Urumqi. Of course, it was a strange route because it would have been easier to go from Almaty through Korgos. However, Bond knew better. They spent a night in Urjar, where they were given a kettle of tea and offered a not very clean bed. In the morning, they finally reached Baktu and the customs point. The whole system is completely automated now and the customs point reconstruction has been finished recently. It's natural that nothing was automated in the 30s. A Soviet border guard checked the documents and smiling suspiciously sent Sir Fitzroy to the Chinese side. Nobody smiled there. They kept him in a closed room for hours and then went back saying, we have no instructions about you. The Kuomintang administration, officially ruling China, was an ally of the Kremlin at the time. He was advised to return to Almaty and then get in touch with the consul. Feeling that he was being made a fool of, the handsome agent left. He was going back by the same bus as if it had waited for him, and he was even more crowded. This time, the agent counted eight children. After that, the events unfolded quickly. He made a few attempts to get in touch with the Chinese authorities and made a decision to stay in Almaty for a long time. He was in the Dom Sovietov Hotel, and after, he had a filling dinner. He heard a loud knock at the door at night. I was sitting up in bed and found myself in the presence of an imposing-looking officer of the NKVD. As the laws of the Soviet republics did not allow foreigners to reside there without special permission, in my case, I had no intention of getting any permission. I was to leave Almata once, from Fitzroy MacLean's eastern approaches. He tried to explain he was a diplomat, had already been here before and hadn't, needing to wait for the decision for the Chinese consulate. Finally, he said he wouldn't go by uncomfortable transport. It was useless. As for comfort, he was provided with escorts and a berth in a compartment. The future Bond went to Moscow, but promised himself that he would certainly return. In October 1938, McLean was in the Aral Sea region. At the stopping places, Kazakh women in their medieval coats of velvet came out of their yurts to sell us kumas, flat unleavened blows, melons, and dried fish from the Sea of Aral. Fitzroy MacLean, from the eastern approaches. Afterwards, he went to Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. He planned to return to Moscow through the steppes of the Caspian Sea region. However, he was denied that because a cholera epidemic had struck Afghanistan and they said that McLean's arrival could have negative influence on the sanitary and epidemiological situation in the region. Epilogue from Kazakhstan with love. As we know, everything happens for a reason, especially when it refers to the person James Bond was based on. His first appearance was connected with apples, the moon over a lake, and collective farm members. It becomes clear that he was doing that if we look at the information he gathered. This information was used in his future projects aimed at the USSR's collapse. The Soviet and Chinese agreement on cooperation was signed the day before. The first two squadrons, fighter bombers, were sent from Almaty to Lanzhou in autumn of 1937. It was military help for China in fighting against Japanese militarism. There were flight personnel training centers in Urumqi, where McLean wanted to go. Soviet instructors taught the Kuomintang members in the late 30s, too. In addition, rumors spread that training bases for saboteurs were in the foothills of the Transili Alatau, including Medel, Talga, and Isik. Some were trained near Medel, where there was an NKVD base. British people were famous for their analytical skills, which helped gather information. James Bond, or Fitzroy MacLean to be exact, was almost famous for that. 
This is what 007's journey in Kazakhstan was really like. <laughs> 